I'm Jesse Fuchs. Hi, I teach here. Uh, I, it is my great pleasure to introduce uh, the inventor of Jenga, which I uh, maybe you did not know was invented, right? <laughs> it's like it's like oh, we have the inventor of dice here. Um, how about that? Um, so, yeah, uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce Leslie Scott. She is the inventor of Jenga. Uh, she is also the founder of Oxford Games and has made other games that are more uh, linguistically oriented, like Ex Libris and Bookworm. Uh, and she's going to talk about two of her games today. And uh, I'm going to just get off the stage because I want to hear what she has to say. So put your hands together for Leslie Scott. All right, let's do some crowd work. Where are you from, sir? <laughs> do we have... Uh, I do have a, a, a small anecdote, which is that uh, over the summer, uh, our friends at Show Up and Sit Down did a, a, a thing, a review, a criticism of Cards Against Humanity, and we were talking about that here at the Game Center, and like, ah, like, isn't that game's been around for a while? Why'd they do that now? And I pulled up the Amazon page for best selling games, and the top eight was Cards Against Humanity, six expansions for Cards Against Humanity, but smack in the middle, Jenga. Jenga is just holding down the fort. Jenga is not going anywhere. Doesn't matter what comes, doesn't matter what goes. Uh, and uh, do, we, do we have. Okay. <laughs> What's the statute of limitations on taking LSD? Because the first time I played Jenga, <laughs> uh, I was 20 and in Denver, Colorado, in a, in a coffee house. And I, I think the game took about 90 minutes. And it was one of the most tense and exciting experiences of my life. So, <laughs> so thank you, Leslie. Sorry, I, I have to use notes. <laughs> I'm sorry about this. And I may have to use my assistant to come and help me <laughs> press buttons in a minute. But Okay. Um, I've been designing games for over 30 years, and board or tabletop games in the main. But in the context of this talk about the creative process of designing these games, it's probably useful to define them all as boxed games. Because while many of my games use neither boards nor even tabletops, every one that's been published is in a box. So it could be said that I've spent the last 32 years of my life thinking inside a box. And I've done a lot of thinking in this time. And I've designed a great many games, many of which have ended up either in a bin. Ah, oh, it works. <laughs> um, or in a file I call My Brilliant Ideas Go Bung. Uh, that's a reference to a book which probably nobody's read. <laughs> um, a few, that's around 40 or so have been published. Fewer still, around 10, have been commercially successful evergreens that have stood the test of time. And of those 10, one became and still is a blockbuster. Aside from this blockbuster, Jenga, the majority of games I've designed or co-designed to date have been published through Oxford Games Limited, the, the company I co-founded with a graphic designer and a very dear friend, Sarah Finch, and which today I run together with my daughter who's a product and game designer, Freddie Scott Volrath. I'm aware that you're interested in the process of designing these games rather than how I set about marketing them. But as I, like all product designers, need to keep in mind the end users of the products we're designing, I would ask you to bear with me if I touch briefly on topics related to marketing from, from time to time. I can divide the games I've designed and published into those I did off my own bat and those I designed to commission. Non-commissioned games were those I chose to develop and publish because I believe the concepts were fun and novel and the game itself was strong enough to stand a chance in either the highly competitive toy industry or the equally challenging gift and book trade, although very different in kind, ranging from the word game anagram 
um, which is actually a really, really tough game. It's been described as, as more of a war game than a, than a word game. Um, uh, through to, to the sort of tower building game Jenga and including um, bluffing parlor games like Ex Libris, which you have to write fake definition, uh, fake, 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 sorry, fake um, first or last lines of a, of a genuine book and, 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 and sort of bluffing people into, into accepting your line as being the, the right one. And flummoxed. These games tend to have many traits in common, probably because they're the kind of games I really enjoy playing myself. So they, essentially, they're, they all tend to have few rules. There's very little extraneous paraphernalia. I, 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 I don't use boards or dice or counters unless they're strictly necessary. They take a relatively short time to play, m uh, minutes, not, not hours. They're very competitive, and yet they're, very highly, they're highly sociable. And they require more skill than chance. In fact, often chance doesn't come into it at all. However, li unlike most games where chance is reduced to a minimum or removed altogether, um, I mean sort of games like chess and checkers, in my games, novices can usually compete successfully with more experienced players, as the skills required are seldom specific to the game. Um, like under the commission games were those that I, I was asked to devise for a specific client or a specific subject matter and probably a specific market too, gift shops, museums, art galleries, that sort of thing, often as merchandise. So I, for example, this is the, the hieroglyphs, hieroglyphs game that I did for um, Oxford University's Ashmolean Museum, um, where my aim was always to create, but my aim is, is always to create good, fun game. It isn't always possible to keep these commissioned games as simple as I like a game to be. As far as my clients were concerned, the subject matter, the graphics, the packaging, the, the retail price point were often more important than whether or not the game worked or not. In some instances, I think I succeeded in balancing all this quite well, and the games were quite fun to play, looked good, and importantly, were commercial successes. Um, there's a game that I did for the, uh, the Royal Shakespeare Company that's actually based on a sort of game of charade, so it's, it sort of engages you with Shakespeare without you having to um, know anything about Shakespeare. In other cases, it didn't go, um, I didn't do quite so well. The games were a little clunky, but the, because of the subject matter and the overall design, they still sold, um, s sold well enough. This is a game I did um, for the uh, National Gallery in, in London and the Royal Academy of Arts. But in one particular case, not only was the game not great, actually it was pretty bad, <laughs> but it also turned out to be a commercial disaster, despite the appealing subject and the great artwork. I can talk about it being great artwork because that's, that was Sarah's job, <laughs> not mine. Um, conscious of the limited time I have now, I thought it might be helpful to focus on the process of designing just two games from my published portfolio. One at each end of the success spe spectrum, so to speak. So Jenga, the most successful, and Hazard, the complete disaster, which takes pride of pace, place in my brilliant ideas go bung file. Um, so Jenga. <laughs> which is now played by <laughs> anything, <laughs> everything. <laughs> they could probably beat me, that too. <laughs> um, okay, Jenga, the first game I published, launched me in my career as a game designer. There were two distinct stages to the design process of this game, kind of before Jenga and after Jenga. Um, the, first the first stage started in, in I sort of need to take you to Ghana in West Africa where I was living at the time with my family. Um, and we were sort of circa 1973 then. And I was playing around with my baby brother's wooden building blocks. He was five at the time and I was 18. And the game evolved. Actually, as games did in my family, in addition to this baby brother, I have a brother two years older than I am and, two years, and, and a sister two years younger than I am. Um, anyway, you know the kind of thing, how, this, how games evolved. You're just playing about, and then someone suggests a point to the play, a goal or goals. So then suddenly you're not just chucking stones randomly, but trying to hit a specific target. Then rules are suggested and rejected, accepted. You take it in turns. You, the stones can only be so big. Um, you can only stand X distance from the, from the, from the target. Um, you get one point of hitting if you hit a leaf, and you get an outright win if you knock a petal off that pink flower. And, and lo and behold, you have the makings of a game a set purpose, a delineated space, rules of play, and most importantly, certainly in my family, how to win. 
In such a way, a simple tower building game using my baby brother's building blocks arose, which we played within the family and among friends. It's important to point out that these blocks were handmade in a variety of Ghanaian hardwoods that were offcuts from a local sawmill. They were slightly but significantly different in size to the, blo the blocks I ultimately designed for Jenga, as, as, I'll, as I'll show. Anyway, we had, a, as a family, had a few sets made, and I brought one such set with me um, when I came to live in Oxford, circa 1976, Oxford. Um, and that was the, 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 the game I brought with me. By the time I sat down to deliberately turn this family pastime into a commercial game, which was about four years later, the game in its first iteration had been well play-tested. Actually, by default, I began to suspect that I was only being invited to supper or a party in Oxford because of my box of bricks. People, <laughs> people love playing it. And it. It's a kind of longish story of why I decided to turn this into a proper game when I did. So I'll skip that part now and concentrate on how. First off, I noticed that assembling a tower of this, at the start of play was awkward and fiddly. The dimensions of the original children's playing blocks meant that you had to quite carefully stack the bricks with gra gaps in the middle, as, as I show here. Um, and um, and beca because of this sort of extreme instability from the beginning of play, the game was usually over quite soon, uh, too soon in my opinion. And there was always a bit of a fuss about who had to rebuild the tower to start a new round. So I experimented with lying the blocks on their flat side, which was OK. Um, I mean, this is not a, obviously an original thing. This was just to s sort of demonstrate this. But, but because of the dimension of the blocks, you, you can't neatly square up the tower if you can, if you can sort of see that they're, they're, they're sort of longer than they are wide, if that makes sense. Um, but with a, um, which meant the tower was easy, easier to, con uh, sorry. And then I, so I sort of, I, so I changed the, t the, the, si the size of these blocks so that they could be stacked like this, sort of neatly. Which meant that the tower was easier to construct to start with and provided a more stable structure on which to build. But with the blocks on their broad sides, the tower now looked too short. I mean, it wasn't as short as that. That was just, <laughs> that's just to show you a sort of example. I think there were, there were flu fewer blocks in the original um, the, I think there were 48, if I, if, I, if I remember properly. Anyway, I play-tested the game over and over, adding and subtracting blocks, and finally decided on 54, which made 15, uh, 18 layers. Um, to be honest, I'm not actually sure why this quantity worked, and still works. There was just something right about the look, feel, proportion of an 18-layer 18, um, 18 tower that appealed, and, and it played well. Uh, um, funny enough, I've, I've always loved the number 18, Apart from it being the day of the month in which I was born, it's a very satisfying number that can be divided by many other numbers, two, three, six, nine, etc. But, but actually, I think that's just by the by. There's just something very satisfying about that number. <laughs> <laughs> um, so having settled on the size and number of blocks required, I now had to figure out how to mass produce these blocks while retaining the subtle differences that are inherent in the handmade wooden blocks that were inherent in that. These, I'd realized by that stage, were essential to the game. These slight differences are what make the game playable in the first instance. If you, if you think about it, if every block were identical in size and weight, none would be more or, or, or um, less loose than another. If you look cl closely at the set that I've got here, um, you can see that some blocks are, are different and can probably, you can probably spot straight away several that would be easy to remove. Um, I'm sure you can, so down <laughs> one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, so down on the eighth row there. I would go for that one on the, on, the, on the left there. I think that would come out extremely easily. <laughs> um, not only are these differences necessary for play, they also ensure that each and every game played is different and the outca outcome is totally unpredictable. Even if each block was removed and placed on the top of the tower in exactly the same sequence as in a previous game, it would be impossible to predict the move that would cause the tower to fall. This unpredictability, in large part, gives rise to the tension that makes Jenga so compelling. At least, that's what I think, with hindsight. <laughs> um, how, to, how, to, you know, how, to, how to introduce this, this randomness into a mass produce was, was, was a challenge. But with the help of a cabinet maker friend of mine, 
I was able to figure out a way of how to mass produce these blocks that were randomly and very slightly different in size, and therefore sub subtly different in weight too. Planks of wood were planed through a template, if you can sort of imagine this, and that introduced tiny differences. So you have this big plank of wood that's going through this, t this, this template that just is, is just slightly off. And then the blocks, once they'd gone through that, the blocks were then cut from these planks. And, and then finally, the cut blocks were tumble polished. I really honestly don't know how Hasbro makes these, these blocks today, but I guess they must use a, a, some, something similar. I mean, probably on a much bigger scale than I was, I was doing at the time, but it would have to do something similar because the blocks still have this, this um, in a genuine Jenga game, they are all slightly different from each other. Anyway, this sorted. I looked out from somewhere to have the blocks manufactured. And by great good fortune, I was introduced to the Camp Hill community in Yorkshire, who had a workshop producing rather wonderful wooden toys. They agreed to produce an initial run of the game. Um, they're, I don't know if you don't know the Camp Hill community, they, they're, they're, they're worldwide, and they're actually the most remarkable places. I would suggest visiting them if anybody doesn't know them. I think there's one in upstate New York. Um, they, they, they basically have communities of people who are of, of, of literally all, all abilities there. Um, anyway, they, they agreed to produce an initial run of the game on the understanding that if it became a success, I'd look elsewhere to have Jenga made. They didn't want to be swamped and find that all they were, ever, they were doing for the rest of their lives was churning out hundreds and thousands of little wooden blocks, even if they all are subtly different one from another. <laughs> Boring <laughs> for them to do that. Um, then I decided how to package the game. Remember, there was nothing like this on the market at the time. I knew it was going to be tough to convey the fun to be had by playing with a pile of wooden bricks. I'd already had um, quite a challenge trying to persuade a bank manager to lend me money. <laughs> and I was going to think, really, really, I'm going to make my fortune from, from this pile of wooden bricks. And, uh, <laughs> he believed me. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, so I, I, um, I settled on a clear plastic sleeve as I thought it was important that people could see that, that the game, at least could, that the game comprised wooden blocks. Plus, actually, to be perfectly honest, this was the cheapest form of packaging I could find <laughs> at the time. And, and, and those, that is a photograph of the only um, set of Jenga that I've got from that period. Because what happened is that this plastic sleeve got very brittle. And so um, after a few a few um, times of putting it in and out, people tended to then end up just putting them in an old shoebox or something. So I was I, actually, that's, um, it's remarkable that that one's still around 30 odd la years later. Anyway. And finally, I decided what to call it, coming up with Jenga, the perpetual challenge. Jenga, by the way, means build in Swahili. It's a language I spoke and still speak, though poorly, having been born and raised in East Africa. I very deliberately set out to find a word that would have no other meaning unless you happen to speak Swahili. Hoping one day that Jenga would come to mean my game. I called it the perpetual challenge because that's what I think it is. It's different every time you play and it's always a challenge. Ultimately, Hasbro dropped perpetual and replaced it with ultimate. They, say that <laughs> they said at the time that no one in North America would know what perpetual meant. <laughs> I don't know, maybe. I thought that was strange, but anyway. But they, but they actually, they also wanted to change Jenga too, and they really, really wanted to change Jenga for the same reasons, because they said no one in North America would know what it means. And I, I argued with them that was kind of the point. But um, I bargained with them, and so I, I gave up Perpetual, provided they would keep Jenga. And finally, one small but very important point was I filed for a patent for Jenga. My patent attorney thought I had a good chance of having a patent granted because using these subtly different blocks was, was novel enough, in his opinion. And I trademarked the name Jenga. Sadly, I couldn't afford to take that patent beyond the patent pending stage, so I dropped it 18 months later, which is another very long story. But um, I was granted the trademark in Jenga, and that's still in place today. Um, it's been argued, in fact, I've suggested this myself, that the continuing commercial sense of success of Jenga has a lot to do with the name I gave the game, and importantly, the fact that I trademarked this name. I'm just going to try and show, show you. This, this was a, 
the very first um, advert uh, that came out for Jenga, and I don't know how to turn it on. <laughs> Do I just click here? Yeah, just click. Ah, this needs sound. It really needs sound. <laughs> Anyway, it's very 1980. <laughs> oh, it should be getting sound, right? <laughs> okay, well, I mean, I can act it. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, don't worry. I mean, I, I can sort of act it. Okay. I mean, I can turn the gun. I mean, it, it, I don't think anybody here is old enough to remember this advert, but it. Oh. It's not coming out at all. So it's it's yeah. Okay. Um, the key to this is, that, I mean, they, 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 having accepted the fact that they, that, um, uh, that they were going to have to call it Jenga, <laughs> they actually went wholeheartedly and and, and produced this advert, which, which they sing this this little song that goes. Jenga, Jenga, j -j -j Jenga. <laughs> I mean, it's really, I thought it was really cool. Uh, and at the end of this, the t as the tower falls, it says the, the, the great game with the strange name. <laughs> so I thought, okay, they, they, they'd accepted it was going to be Jenga. They never, they never reverted to being able to call it perpetual, but still. Anyway. <laughs> okay, but um, before moving on from Jenga, I just wanted to, to mention... Um, um, that a few years ago, a company called um, Natural Motions, um, who you may know, they, 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 did, they did, I think, a lot of the simulation behind Grand Theft Auto, and they have a number of um, very successful apps. And they're a spin-out company from, from, from Oxford University. Um, they approached me and asked whether they could do a, a, a put Jenga on as an app. Um, and what I found fascinating about this, I mean, they say I co-designed it with them. I have absolutely no idea how they did this. So all I, all I was doing was sort of saying what I would, if you were going to turn something three-dimensional like Jenga into a two-dimensional game like, like, an, like an app, I thought it should have elements that you can't do in real life. And so, it has, it, I mean, they, they, they built that in, in in spades. So you can go back to the moment before you... Um, the tower falls and sort of replay it and do all sorts of things like that. But the key thing that I think is really exciting is that they built into that the same thing that Jenga actually has, which is these differences in, 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 um, in, in the size and the weight of the, the blocks. Um, they said because of the physics involved in doing that, there was a, they couldn't make all 54 of them randomly different. I think there's sort of 18 different differences in there. Um, but it does mean that when you're playing this game, you are, you are really playing. If it really matters which block you, you take and you put on the top and where you put it on the top actually makes a difference to how the game plays, which I thought was, was um, probably as close as you could get to simulating a, the, the, the real game. <coughs> it's pretty cool, and I'm absolutely useless at it. So <laughs> They asked me to go online and actually sort of so people could play with me online, and it was too <laughs> humiliating. I think I, 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 I didn't do that one. Okay. So over the course of some eight or nine years, I'd formed a very good relationship. Um, oh, sorry. I'm going to go back to this a bit, a bit and say, so talking about the name of the Jenga, and it was ironically, it was the name I chose to give one of my commissioned games, Hazard, that led it to being the least commercially successful of all the games I've, I've designed and published to date. So let me explain. Um, over the course of some eight or nine years, I'd formed a very good relationship with a company called Historical Collections, which had um, a very successful mail order catalogue and chain of shops um, called Pastimes. As their game suggests, they sold replicas or historically imp inspired gifts and books. A number of OG games did exceedingly well through Pastimes. Um, this was one of the ones that I, um, I had designed. T Tabula is based on... Um, it's based on the forerunner of backgammon. I mean, they've found lots of tabular games, 
but nobody's ever really um, known exactly how the game's played. They do know that it's a forerunner of, of background. And so I sort of took the, the liberty, if you like, of actually giving Tabula a set of rules. And, and then they've never found a foresight. It, 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 it arranged like that. It's more normally arranged um, like, like a normal backgammon set. But I, I sort of took that liberty. I thought, well, nobody really knows how the game was played, so I might as well give it <laughs> these rules. And it's actually, that, that's, that's one of the games that did extremely well through past times and continues to do quite well through other, other outlets. Anyway, the, having had it, um, having had sort of success for Tableau and things, they asked, they started to commission games from from Oxford Games that they could have exclusive rights to for a given period, usually one or two years. In general, how this worked is that I would meet up with past times development teams sometime in spring to discuss ideas for the following year's fall or winter catalogues. Sometimes I would suggest topics for a game, like the game of Maze was one of them, and. The Sailor's Knot, which is a which is a, it's a very simple game based on um, shut the box, but you have to sort of go around collecting knots. Other times they would tell me that what would be a particular focus for them the next year, and I would design a game with this in mind. Hazard was one such game. They told me that the next year was the 600th anniversary of Geoffrey Chaucer's Canterbury Tales, and they were planning to produce all sorts of relevant product, facsimiles of original manuscripts and that kind of thing. Um, and so it would be great if I could come up with a game. Um, off I went to work on a game based on the Canterbury Tales. The first thing I did was research the background. Of course, I knew something about these tales. Every English school child does. But I can't say I ever studied them in detail. So this was quite an adventure for me. Written in the vernacular of the time, what we now call Middle English, the 24 tales are presented as part of a storytelling contest devised by a group of pilgrims who, to, to entertain each other as they travel together on a journey from London to Canterbury in order to visit the shrine of St. Thomas Becket at Canterbury Cathedral, and then they go back to London. The prize for the winner of this contest was to be a free meal at the Tabard Inn in Southwark in London on their return. So, a good start, I thought. Chaucer, by setting his collection of short stories within this frame story, had already structured the, his work as a kind of game. Much of my work was done for me. I decided the game would involve moving around a circular board from London to Canterbury and back to London. And the board could be divided into 24 segments, each to represent a different pil pilgrim. Written well before the printing press was invented, during his own lifetime, Chaucer's work was, the, was only available in handwritten copies. Um, one of the most famous of which to survive is this beautifully illustrated Ellesmere manuscript. So we plan to use the images from this to illustrate the game. Um, and we, um, Sarah redrew the, 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 the images from the Ellesmere. Um, all well and good. I, thought I could imagine a most attractive board, but now needed several other ingredients to turn this into a game. A game that was more interesting and challenging to play than simply rolling dice and moving around a board. Also, without being too obviously didactic, because I'd found that to imply that a game might be educational in, in the market into which I was selling it was, in my experience, the kiss of death. <laughs> I mean, it just there was, n there was no way, way beyond that. I also wanted to give players at least an entertaining introduction to the tales. After all, it, I'd been commissioned to produce something that would both capture the essence of the Canterbury Tales as well as function as a game in its own rights. This is quite a design challenge. This Middle English, the, uh, written in Middle English, the tales appear daunting. Though actually, as, as I'm sure you know, some are exceedingly bawdy. Lots of adultery, drinking, gambling, farting, and general mayhem goes on in them. But how to give a taster of this without swamping the game with too much detail? How to introduce Middle English without assuming you had to be a Chaucerian scholar to play the game? And how to make it entertaining without losing sight of the fact that this is one of the most important works of literature in the English language? I decided to represent each tale with a playing card. Some of the tales get two or even three cards. Each card bears the opening line of the tale in original Chaucerian English, with the more difficult to understand bits in translation. Um, players were then given four of these cards at the start of the game and told that the object of the game was to move around the board and be the first to make it back to Southwark, um, having successfully deposited all four cards. And to deposit a card, you had to land on the corresponding pilgrim on, on the board. Okay, now how to move around the board in a more interesting way than just rolling dice. 
Here I had a lucky break, or, s or so I thought at the time. Reading the work with the help of a Middle English dictionary, I came across mentioned in several of the tales that the pilgrims played a gambling game called Hazard. I investigated further and discovered that Hazard, or Hazard, or Hazard, it's spelled various ways, is an early English game with somewhat complicated rules played with two dice. It's been very popular for centuries and was often played for money. In the 19th century, the game Craps developed from Hazard through a simplification of the rules. And Craps is, uh, is now still popular in North America, although neither game remains popular in the rest of the world. So I, th I thought there were sort of various images for playing Craps. I mean Hazard, rather. So I thought here potentially was a more interesting way of moving around the board and one that was highly relevant to the game. I simplified the rules by introducing cards which fixed a winning point and a losing point. And after play testing the game, I tweaked the rules so that regardless of whose turn it was to roll the dice, every player was required to bet one or more tokens, up to four on the outcome. If the dice thrower achieved a winning point, he or she could move the number of spaces forwards or backwards, equivalent to the number of total tokens bet. If he or she rolled the losing point, Every other player would move their playing pieces forwards or backwards a number of squares equivalent to the tokens the dice roller had placed. <coughs> there were a couple of other scores that were important, 11 and 2. If the caster threw, throws 11, 6 and 5, you can move your piece any number of squares up to the total number of tokens bet. If you throw double ace, um, 1 and 1, you can't move at all. But every other player can move their pieces up to the total number of tokens bet. Um, the mechanism worked well enough as a means of regulating movement around the board, and importantly, I, f I felt, it ensured that players were always engaged in paying attention and paying attention. There was no frustrating downtime while other players took turns. On reflection, I think I could have outlined, uh, outlined the rules of the original game of Hazard in the rule book that, I, that was included in, in, in the box, and provided a table showing the probability of throwing a winning or a losing number which would have explained why I, why I had selected the particular winning and losing points, per, points in the first place. Anyway, the game was designed and illustrated and had a name, Hazard, from the Canterbury Tales. I didn't even consider trying to trademark the name Hazard for the game because I knew that the game of Hazard had been around since the 14th century. In other words, I wasn't using a novel word or expression to label my game, as I'd done with Jenga, Far from it, as far as I was concerned, trying to trademark Hazard as a name for, of the game would have been as odd as trying to trademark the name Chess for a game of chess, or Backgammon for a game of Backgammon. If ever there'd been a name in the public domain, it was, it was Hazard. Um, they're not my favorite game, I have to admit. <laughs> not enough scope, there, there really isn't enough scope for players to feel they're making informed decisions about how many tokens to bet. The game was published and selling through pastimes catalogs and stores, and actually doing quite well. When, out of the blue, Pastimes and I received um, a lawyer's letter telling us to cease and desist. The lawyer said that the, we were infringing his client's trademark of the name Hazard for a board game. He had uh, it was a board game he had designed based on golf. This golf game was not in production. In fact, it, it was never produced. But it's true. The Patent Office of London had granted this lawyer's client, his lawyer's, this lawyer's client, a trademark for the word hazard in class 28, which um, covers all playthings and board games. I'm, I'm only showing this because I actually found this online. It's, as you can see, it's dead. <laughs> but but he, 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 did, he did actually have, he did have this, tra this he had been granted this trademark. Um, pastimes, uh, uh, management and I and I decided to ask our lawyer to challenge the patent office, now called the Intellectual Property Office. How we argued was it possible for someone to be granted a trademark for a word to be used as a name of a game when the word itself describes that game? In fact, the dictionary definition of the word hazard is a game. I've got it here. It's a game of dice in which chances are complicated by a number of arbitrary rules. And all other definitions of the word stem from this original meaning of the word, such as when the word hazard <coughs> is used to mean risk or chance, or even to hazard a guess, comes from this. And most important of all, the term hazard in a golf to donate bunkers and sand and water and all kinds of bad ground comes from this original meaning hazard to describe a particular game. 
So the game, the game that was actually played by the Pilgrims in the Canterbury Tale, and therefore the game I was asking players to play when they played Hazard, the game from the Canterbury Tales. Anyway, we produced dictionaries and reference books and much other material to prove our point that the Patent Office should never have granted this trademark in the first place. Our lawyer said that we had an open and shut case that we should win, but once we realized that this was nevertheless going to cost us a serious amount of money to fight, considerably more than our game was worth to us, we dropped the fight and withdrew the game from the market, and what's more, even actually had to pay the owner of ha Hazard compensation for infringing his trademark. So that was the end of Hazard. <laughs> Um, I, I'm actually telling this tale to illustrate that there is much to the process of designing and publishing board games in addition to figuring out the mechanics of play or the rules. Regardless of how well conceived, how exhaustively tried and tested, how beautifully produced the game might be, if it isn't a commercial success, that game is doomed to end up in the brilliant ideas go bung file. So I'm afraid we designers of games have to consider rules of the marketplace too. Whether we decide to keep them or break them, we need to be fully aware that they exist. That one's. Okay. <laughs> um, I, a, I don't think this is going to work, but I, was just, I just thought I'd, I'd, yeah. I thought, I thought I'd just round this off. I mean, the, again, if the sound doesn't work, it may, it may not be quite so much fun, but there's a, this is my, my, my um, it's completely irre irrelevant to this talk, but it's a, it's a, um, a more recent advert of, the, of Jenga, where the, it's actually, um, it's a game within a game. So this is why I was going to play this and see if the sound works. But if it doesn't work, then, ah, sorry. It's not gonna work again. I don't think. They say at the beginning, and you probably didn't notice this, it says, um, glued Jenga blocks were used in it to make this. <laughs> 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 yeah. Tumblr page. Yes. Oh, you did? Everyone okay. Can look it up. Okay. Uh, thank you, Wesley, <laughs> Pleasure. enormously for a fantastic talk. <laughs> thank you. Uh, <laughs> time for a couple of questions. Absolutely. Yes. Uh, yes. So I'll just pick. Uh, yes. Uh, I was just curious about the decision to remove the hazard from the market completely. Why didn't you just change the name? Ah, because uh, actually, that's a very good point. But, but um, <laughs> that would have mean re. Printing, we, we would have had sort of, I don't know, 5,000 boxes of this game already printed and ready. I mean, to, it just wasn't that big a, a, a game for us. Um, um, plus, <laughs> I still feel that we had the right to use the word hazard. <laughs> I still think that guy was wrong, but anyway. <laughs> yes, it's a principle. Uh, yeah, in the back. Which right. is uh, it's a horror game, and successive players have rolling dice. You play, you remove a block from Jenga, and when the tower falls, your character gets killed. <laughs> uh, and I, there's all sorts of other versions of Jenga where variants where people will like write things on Jenga. Mm -hmm. blocks. Mm -hmm. I was just curious what you thought about all these sort of remix versions. Personally, I I I find it very exciting that 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 that, that Jenga sort of become, if you like, part of culture in the way that it's, I mean, it's used as a randomizer by the sounds in, 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 uh, of um, the game Dread and that 
And I, I mean, I love it personally. Um, <laughs> what Hasbro think about this? <laughs> Who actually have you know have the rights to to um, the name and the use? I I I I, I, I don't want to speak for them, but for me personally, I'm I. <laughs> <laughs> it's cool. <laughs> uh, let's see. Uh, yeah, Jen. So I love the concept of the brilliant ideas that go bum file, just of all the things that end up there. And I was just wondering if there was any particular like brilliant idea that went bum for you <laughs> that you wish was still like, or just a, a brilliant idea from that file that you, you know, would have liked to see happen, but just for various reasons didn't. Um, they're probably too. I mean, actually, that bung file, it still exists, and 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 we have a sort of saying that. But I mean, I I go in 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 in. Um, in uh, following this, I go to a, a, a show in in um, Chicago, where we're presenting um, new ideas to some of the bigger publishers. Um, I mean, I personally don't do that very much now, but my my, my daughter does it. Um, and we have this thing like it's sort of bring out your dead because we we kind of go through the bung file and see if there's anything that could be redone. But my personal favourite from that, that one day I'm going to do this, was was a game that I, I did, which we called Mutton, the great game of sheep. It's so good, <laughs> <laughs> but nobody wants it <laughs> so far. So far. <laughs> I'll just point out that in Australia, more popular than Monopoly is Squatter, the sheep farming game. Oh. So you might want to look into okay. that's a good market. <laughs> uh, we have one more question. Uh, who has a final question? Yeah. Okay, how do I have to go ahead? I was going to say, it probably says more about your family. <laughs> Very rude. <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't know. I I think it's such a relief when 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 you're not the one that knocks it over. I I I I'm, um, I've actually heard I've actually heard the game referred to as a cooperative game, which I I I don't necessarily subscribe to. I think it's incredibly competitive. But um, that that actually there are not many games where. When the as the tension's building, you d you do find that people actually want it to carry on getting higher. They're not they're not necessarily egging somebody on to to knock it over. Um, you, uh, I don't know if I'm answering your question. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I think I think that uh, you know depends on the group that you're with whether. Okay. I'll go to okay. <laughs>